Friends, this morning, we are presented with one of those gospel texts that presents a challenge. Someone in Jesus' time afflicted with demon possession. And in Mark's gospel, this is one of his prevailing themes. And my goal for preaching before you always is to take these 2,000-year-old stories and make them relevant today. Do you see relevance from this text to you today? It's rare, but it happens. We hear of some person in some country that we've never heard of who is demon-possessed. Maybe a 20-second news blurb. Or we hear of possession or voices in one's head as a legal defense against crimes committed. And we don't always buy it. We are skeptical. We put such claims in the same basket as alien abductions, UFO sightings, and Bigfoot as far-fetched news stories. With demon possession, we downplay spiritual warfare between God and the devil with us in the battlefield because well, we cannot see it. And yet, friends, you and I know that God's word is God-breathed and useful for our knowledge of salvation and of the Savior who accomplished our salvation. So let us greet this text today and maybe, just maybe, glean something beneficial for our faith today. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we are only in chapter 1 of Mark's Gospel, but already Jesus is revealed as the world's Savior. John the Baptist has announced him. He's been baptized by John. The dove has ascended on him. God's own voice spoke his pleasure on his son. He's been tempted in the desert, and there he defeated Satan soundly in round one of this heavyweight spiritual battle for our souls. Jesus has begun his ministry, called disciples to follow him. He's become a regular guest preacher in various synagogues through Capernaum. Yes, chapter 1 of Mark, Jesus is off to a fast start. Now, I want you to imagine yourself inside one of these first century synagogues. Just imagine what you're wearing. And imagine the preaching of Jesus compared to every other priest or scribe at the time. While most of the priests would espouse legalistic demands of the law based on the Old Testament scrolls, Jesus preached the gospel, the forgiveness of sins, seeking mercy and grace from God rather than trying to earn favor. Jesus was not merely some wise teacher or inspirational speaker whose words we pattern our lives after. His preaching was authoritative and his word final. It reveals to us the life-changing blessing, the undeserved love that God sends to his people to save us from sin and Satan. Jesus' life, teaching, and eventual sacrifice would mean the end of Satan's power over the people, over you and over me. 
And even though Satan lost the battle of wits in the desert, he was not taking defeat lying down. Satan would find his power in turning God's God's people away. Shedding doubt on that authority. Spreading lies. Putting a wedge between God and the crowning jewel of his creation, mankind. Satan possesses this one man in our reading and through him takes a shot at Jesus. The demon, strangely enough, identifies Jesus as the Holy One of God. But Jesus instantly shuts the demon down. Demons would not bring the testimony of who Jesus is. Satan is not a true witness. Satan is the prince of lies. And that demon, he had to succumb to the power of Jesus. Now, so far, all I've done is given you the first century backstory to this gospel lesson. I've not yet made it relevant to your life today, have I? And it is true, we hear little of demon possession today. We could easily just dismiss this story as Bible legend and leave today no further ahead than when we arrived. Yet, have we forgotten the word temptation? Is temptation not an effort on the part of the enemy to own you, to pull you away from God? Is temptation not an effort to control the framework of your inner thoughts? and the desires of your heart? Does temptation not lure you away with the enticement of things self-serving, forbidden, or immoral? Have we forgotten the word distraction? Our lives filled with stimuli that leave us precious little time for the things of faith, little time for God, for giving thanks and praise. Another attempt to control our lives. Another attempt to keep us too busy, too preoccupied, turned away from seeking the grace of God. Have we forgotten the word doubt? Satan's job description from the beginning. To shed doubt or uncertainty on God's word. To create unbelief. To make us trust ourselves rather than our creator. To make us seek our own wayward path instead of the road to salvation. To make us elevate ourselves or serve ourselves. To strive for instant gratification at the expense of our neighbor rather than to take the path of humility, the path of the cross. To create impatience in us, losing sight of God and his blessings yet to come for us. Do not doubt distraction and temptation attempt to possess us and take us away from the gospel teaching, the authoritative word of God. Does not our own science offer alternative origins to our existence? Do not false doctrines, cults, and pagan religions lean away from Scripture? And all the time competing for our hearts and minds. Can we not say the battle to possess us The battle for our hearts and minds is relevant today. And Satan and his brood of demons have adapted themselves to the times in which we live. So what are we to do? Oh, isn't that the wrong question? 
and typical of our faulty nature to assume that we can assist the gospel work of Christ like those early synagogue priests. Friends, it's never been about what we must do, but about what Christ has done. This is what makes gospel, gospel. The wedge of separation and rebellion that Satan put between man and God when temptation and sin cast doubt on God's word of truth has been removed with the cross of Jesus and his resurrection. And through our baptism into Christ, where Jesus has been, we are taken. Our new life in Christ, forgiven and redeemed, has begun. And Satan has no power over us. He is a defeated enemy. Oh, he may buzz and he may cause a stir, but our lives have been reclaimed and redeemed by the one with command over the unclean spirits, the spirits of both then and today. The works that Jesus has done, his power over demons, his many miracles, his healing hand upon sinners, both physically and spiritually, his power over life and death, his love for you and me that he died for each of us, his rising from the dead to proclaim that he is Lord of all. It is Christ who has ultimately won us, and we are his possession. And that possession is ensured for all eternity. Jesus' own words confirm this. When he said in John's gospel, Jesus said, the works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Do these comforting words from our Lord Jesus not speak to us today just as they did to those of 2,000 years ago? In the ongoing battle for our hearts and our souls, we belong to him. We are Jesus' prize possession. Friends, rest assured, in the grace of an unwavering, unfailing God who has brought you back from the power of the enemy with his eternal grace. Amen.